Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to Molten Modular DIY. Today, I'm having a stab at the Dreadbox dis Dysphonia. Dis Dysphon Dysphonia. Now, this is a synthesizer that just popped up on Dreadbox website. There was no tease, there was no coming soon. It just, boom, it was there. And what is it? Well, we don't really know, but it was so kind of cool and funky. Uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm just going to I'm gonna have a go. I'm going to have a punt at it. So I bought it as soon as I saw it, and it's turned up yesterday. And I thought, right, I've got an hour, maybe two. I don't really, but let's pretend that I do have this sort of time just free, just spare going around. And I thought I would give it a stab. Now, Dreadbox say that it's a good kit for beginners <laughs> so i'm a perpetual beginner uh, kind of as in i fiddle my way through all sorts of different diy projects so i thought perhaps it would be useful for me to give this a go and at the end we'll actually get to hear what it sounds like because i haven't even heard what it sounds like so what is it well go to the dreadbox website and have a look and uh and maybe they've got some sound examples up there now who knows but hopefully by the end of this video i'll be able to give it a bit of a demo yeah so let's have a look at the kit and then let's get stuck in and see actually how possible this thing is to make in an hour or two let's see so in the in the box we get a nice bag a nice pressed bag of that looks like hardware so you've got uh, knobs you've got all the patch points and you've got some sliders and bits and pieces. Yeah, great. So this is the front panel. So this is what we're building. What is it? Well, it's an entire synthesizer. An entire synthesizer voice with modulation, with effects, with a filter built in. And it can be either on your desktop or it can be in Eurorack. It's quite big for Eurorack, but then it, it is an entire voice. So by that we mean uh, oscillator, VCAs filter envelopes lfos etc so that is what we're heading for uh, ultimately not going to need this for a little while put that to one side we've got a midi cable so it's midi compatible also a power for euro rack a little usb to modular power supply mm, interesting i've got a i've got a sticker and then ooh, a couple of pcbs so this looks like it's going to stack now all the surface mount has been done for you as you can see quite a lot in fact has been done there so it looks like essentially we're going to be dealing with the hardware for the front panel this is the other PCB which is seems to be sealed so here it's going to be the front panel which I imagine is what we're going to spend most of our time on okay two of those anything else in the box no right I'll put the front panel in the box put the box out of the way for the moment so we've got two large PCBs, a little PCB, and a shed load of components. Right, let's get to it. So there's a manual, there's nothing in the box to tell you how to put it together, but there is a manual which says what's in the box. So before we get started, make sure you have basic soldering skills. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's us scuppered to start with. So when it says uh, this is a good DIY project for, for beginners, they mean people who have soldered before. Okay. If it, it Oh, hang on. If this is your first time soldering, there are several tutorials that might help. So, you know, go and do some tutorials first is, is kind of what they're saying. Fair enough. Let's open up these into piles. Right, I'm going to make a pile of that over there. Oh. Come on. It's 
That appears to be empty. Good. Right, get rid of that. So I should have 46 of these. 13 rotaries. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 sliders. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2 push button with LEDs. They look like they could be those things. It could be those. Yeah, I reckon. Two of those. Three female. 20 pin. One, two, three, four, five, seven, and 10. Two. Three of those. One 10 pin. Yep. Yeah. One of those power connectors. A USB jack. Some M3 bolts with hex heads. Oh, hex heads. Why, do, why does anyone ever use hex heads? Is it some kind of security thing? So if somebody's going to rob your house, they're not going to be able to undo them quite so easily as if, you know, if they were Phillips. I mean, maybe it's a standard somewhere, but I'm always scrapping around to try to find something which is going to fit that, which means I've got <laughs> this big wad of, of Allen keys, which is not the easiest thing to... Uh, to use to undo those sorts of screws so I'm not a fan of the hex screws I have to say but heck that's what we've got uh, oh look there's some Phillips bolts as well why couldn't they all be those who knows there's some plastic spacers yeah I think I've got those yeah some washers a couple of those yep yeah, yeah that all looks good to me it looks like we have everything in the kit now there's a picture of the tools that you'll use which is a little bit frightening i have to say i mean yeah look look at the state, <laughs> the state of that <laughs> don't worry is what oh well, magnet in the self to things don't worry is what i would say all you really need is a soldering iron and a pair of of, of clippers you know to, to clip legs off things that's pretty much it oh and some solder Anything other than that is a bit of a bonus, and you'll probably find things hanging around the place. If you don't have a digital multimeter, which it says you're going to need at some point, then it's the sort of thing your dad will have. Someone will have one. Put a message out on Facebook and say, can I borrow a digital multimeter? Because, you know, you use it rarely, but it does come in handy from time to time. But I'm sure you can find one from somewhere if you don't have one already. So don't get boggled by the amount of kit you're supposed to need. You can get by with a cheap soldering iron, some cheap solder, you know, and and a, and a good attitude, <laughs> I would say. But of course, if you do have access to lots of equipment, that's excellent. So preparation of the bottom board, it says, is how we're going to start. So for this step, you will need the bottom board, which is not that one. I'll put that to one side for the moment. That's this one here. Mm, interesting. A soldering iron, some solder, 0.7 millimeters apparently. Look at that, that's what mine is. What a coincidence. A cutter, so they are that, they mean these sorts of cutter, plier type tweezer things that cut as opposed to don't cut, so they have to be sharp, yeah. And the 10 pin ribbon mail connector. Ooh, we really are doing this one thing at a time. So this is the ribbon connector, I think. I'm gonna go with that. Solder the ribbon connector to the bottom side of the board as shown in the pictures this needs to go on this side of the board there with its bit that's cut out next to the bit that's cut out there of course we're gonna to have to turn it upside down in order to solder it and you want it to stay relatively flat there's different ways of doing this i tend to just sort of fudge it like onto there <laughs> so there it is now if i leave this like that it's going to end up a little bit slanted so i'll find something of a relative height put that underneath so that's pretty flat that feels pretty flat to me safety specs because you don't want solder in the eye also i've got a fan here that i turn on which just blows the the fumes from the solder away i can't see anything through these glasses so yeah, if you're doing a lot of soldering, I would recommend having some kind of some kind of fan or at least have all the windows open, get a bit of air circulating through because you don't really want to breathe in the fumes from solder, particularly if you're using leaded solder like I am. If you're using lead-free solder, good good for you. It, it will just probably 
just be that tiny bit harder because it it's, takes longer to melt, I would say. Um, you don't want to be breathing that stuff in either because it's all got rosin and bits and pieces involved. All of it is, is, uh, is, is there to kill you at the first opportunity. So just get some air flowing. Get something blowing away the... Oh, I've blown all that. <laughs> blowing away the fumes. And then not mess not mess it all up. Right, so that's okay, that, there again. Let's stop procrastinating. Try to get my, my eye in. <laughs> and so then just stick the soldier iron on one of the legs. And present some solder. That should just all flow on there nicely. Take the solder off first, then release. Then I'm going to do the other leg on the opposite side. Stick some solder in there. It should flow on. Take the solder off first, and then the soldering iron. You understand that I'm assuming I'm talking to beginners like myself so i'm gonna i'm gonna over explain i hope that's okay it'll probably make this a long video but that's what we're here to do we're here to 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 take our through take ourselves through this step by step we're not in a rush we're not in a hurry to get it finished we're not trying to you know i'm going to be doing some time lapsing so it can get a bit dull <laughs> just watching me do it real time but we're just gonna you know go through it methodically is the idea so what i've done i've done either corner and I'm going to have a look at it to see that it's relatively straight and in the right place and the right way around. And now I can do the rest without really worrying about it too much because I know that it's in straight. So, solder, soldering iron. I'm trying to decide whether I'm going to need to put my magnifying glasses on or not. My eyesight is is fairly, fairly ropey these days. I think, I think I might be all right. I think this is going to be large enough for me to cope just from a safe distance be able to see it well enough maybe not i don't know maybe reading glasses is what i need oh, that's just so so sad makes me think i'm turning into a really old person which of course i am so as you can see i've sort of done it for, i just got on with it just stabbed the thing in there heated stuff up um i can't i know i can no longer see damn it so i have these which are marvelous and full of spiders and they're just magnifiers for people who have crappy eyesight like myself and need to be able to see what the heck's going on so i'm just going to have a look at this a little bit closer see that's so much better my eyes are they've had it they've had it <laughs> oh dear um yeah that looks good to me they all look soldered Good to you under there. Good. That's our first start. Now I feel like we've we've done the first thing we needed to do, which is a little bit of a breakthrough. Good. So now we can move on confidently, knowing that our solder is working, everything's working. We've done something so far, so good. Right. Let's get on with it then. So next it says cut the excess wires. Really? From the pre-assembled trimmers and remove the extra PCB from the top and bottom side of the board oh wow okay so there these ones here these trimmers uh, are all sticking up a little bit I mean they're not really sticking up enough to cut off I don't think I would be quite happy leaving that on but hey let's do what it says right uh, again you'll need your spectacles on because little shards of metal flying around is not a good thing so they are all here and you just want to go along and nip them off. Ooh. Some things fly, some things don't. Good. And then they want you to snap this edge off, top and bottom. That's scary. Now for that, you can use the same uh, oh my goodness your clippers and it should literally just snap off there you might want to use a different pair of pliers which is not quite so cutty so I've got a different pair here so I'm just going to go along this edge and very gingerly bend that off a little bit there a little bit there 
little bit there it's very scary but it does come off it's supposed to come off that's what it's supposed to do so that's that side and this side oh we've got the uh, the cockerel back that's nice they are further away these days so we don't get quite so much of the chicken action in our videos so those came off nicely yeah good now we're moving to the power board which is this fella here for this step we're going to need solder solder iron again the usb jack the 10 pin header just those two bits i have to say so far the manual is is great it really is taking you through step by step it's telling you what you need it's not trying to make you work that out for yourself and you know good so far good so far i've not done a dreadbox um kit before so uh this is my first experience of their uh, of the way they do their manuals and bits and pieces so so far so good you can also use this board as a genet as a generic modular power supply so essentially what they're saying is in order to make this a generic one you need to put on this <laughs> instead of this and then you can connect it with a ribbon to uh, do anything you like. I think that's what it's saying. But let's ignore all of that because we're trying to make the, the dysphonia. This goes in there. Like so. You have to solder all of that underneath. And this, doesn't matter which way round it goes goes into the middle where it's marked now as you can see possibly when I turn this over the height of these is different and so if I attempt to turn it over in order to solder it this one is going to fall out no matter what I do see it's no longer there so I want to be able to solder that first before the taller USB component now there's other things you can do like you can use a bit of masking tape to, to attach that on and that, that can make things a little bit simpler but I just tend to skip straight to the chase Now again that's going to fall over so I just want something under there to keep it about the right height like so and what I'm going to do, I'm going to do my corners again but as I push down on this with my soldering iron, it should level it out a little bit. So I'm going to heat up that pin, add some solder. I'm going to hold this flat before I remove. I'm going to give that a look. That looks nice and flat to me. So I can then do the rest of it. I do the opposite corner first. And then we can do all of the rest. Good, you see, I've got bit of solder stuck on the end of my solder iron so I can jab it into my um, copper bird's nest thing or wipe it on the sponge just to take that off so that's on that's nice and flat good now this USB bit seems to go in pretty solidly so I've got no worries with having that upside down and just soldering it in The, uh, the big sort of feet probably need a little bit longer holding the soldering iron on it before you then jam a whole load in there. You've got to imagine that, that the USB port gets a lot of strenuous action from plugging in cables and such like so it needs to have a good load of solder on those legs in order to keep it 
nice and steady. That's good. That's looking good. Happy with that. I'll look a bit closer again with me magnifying. I mean, you may have something like this uh, knocking around it's called a helping hands crocodile clip thing, which it mostly drives me nuts. This thing, <laughs> there's probably a knack to it that I just can't seem to have, but it does have a magnifying glass. So that's another way of checking potentially. Oh God, I've still got to find the right checking that your soldering's good. Good. Next. The top board. Right. Well, that seems to be all we're doing on those two bits. So now we're looking at the other board. This one here. So you start by removing the excess. So we've got the similar on the sides here. Use a pair of uh, long nose pliers or whatever. Give it a little bit of a go. And then it should snap off. Nice. Both sides. Great. Locate and place all the jacks. Woo! And then solder them. <laughs> Woo! Now, this is going to be interesting. Am I going to do them all at once and then expect myself to be able to turn the whole lot over to solder them? How am I going to do that exactly? The way they are, they might fit in without falling out. Yeah, see, that could be it. Right. Okay, it suggests you solder them with thicker soldering wire, 1.5 millimeters. But I mean, you've just bought solder; just use solder. It doesn't the thickness of the solder is really, it's not really important. I'm not quite sure why they decided you need two thicknesses of solder. But hey, I mean, they do this sort of thing all the time, so they must know what they're doing. But I'm going to continue on with my 0.7 millimeter and just see how we go. So that is all the information you're getting is that you stick them in just gonna check which way round they go I mean the pictures are absolutely invaluable the fact that they have photos of everything uh, in the manual is is brilliant absolutely applaud that sort of thing so that you have some idea if you're doing it right or not so how many did they say there were 46 Whew, right okay so if you look at the board you'll see you've got three connections and if you look on your adapter here you've got three legs two and then a one yeah so these are simply gonna go in there now do they push in yes they do and they hold nicely so that's the answer is that they all go in and you're gonna be able to turn it over and solder it without them falling out brilliant so I'm probably going to stop talking at this point and just get on with putting these in and I'll speed up the film so you don't have to listen to me going on all the time. Right, 
right I've just gone into the flow of things now and I've done this whole lot so I've got these last three left and what I would say is that the reason why they wanted you to use thick um, solder is because these legs these stability legs they require a heck of a lot you've got to keep pushing the stuff in there because ideally what you want is to fill that whole space so that you can you know you see the solder fill up that space you don't want any gaps in there and that would tell you that you've got a good a good solder joint on that so you need to be putting a lot of it in um, so let me show you how I did these in real time just to give you a better idea now my soldering iron I generally have it quite hot mine's at 390 degrees now you may not have a soldering iron that has um, a temperature gauge on it that's okay it may just simply mean that you're going to have to hold the soldering iron there longer now I know you know you watch professionals do it in these videos and they just go shoo, 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 and they're soldering away like a crazy person that may not be your experience when you're doing this to start with you know don't worry just relax take your time and it will happen so what I do on these legs as I stick the soldering iron on it now you're not looking at the tip of the soldering iron to heat something up you sort of want the tip and a bit of an edge so if you get the tip in there and have the edge up against the leg that's going to heat up much quicker than just trying to get the tip in there so you're kind of working out how how best to hold that against that leg and then you don't want to put the solder on the iron because it just goes up the iron and stays on that and doesn't go onto your joint so you want to stick the solder on the other side and then move it towards the iron yeah because at the moment it's not melting which means that the whole thing is not quite hot enough but once it starts to melt right if you just get to the edge where the soldering iron is it'll then all start to melt and start to flow in there do you see that and now it's full you can see that there's solder all the way through that joint i'll do it again on this one so i'm holding on it's heating up now it may be hot enough for it will start melting here but the probability is that you'll have to stick the solder kind of further in that hole towards the end of the iron if you get some on it that's all right don't worry about it and then that fills up with the smaller one it's not quite such a problem but again you've got the point in the hole and you've got the side of the soldering iron against the leg and then that very easily melts in there beautifully and you look at it and you go well that's just amazing so by golly those are all in that's a good start isn't it look at that that's like proper jack sockets now I hope <laughs> that these are all in straight enough to fit with the front panel because often when you do soldering of patch sockets like this you would put the front panel on in order to make sure they're all correctly positioned but the nature of these particular patch sockets is that they fit and click in and are not really in any danger of being slightly askew or uh, off centered so we're just going to go with what the instructions are telling us and then that should all just be fine right moving on solder them all yeah did that next locate the two push buttons there's a warning coming up that's that's never a good sign <laughs> so these two fellas they have a polarity and need to be respected okay if not placed correctly they will be damaged and removing them is a challenging task okay oh they're buttony 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 okie dokie so check the bottom side for the plus sign should match the square pad on the pcb oh i'm going to need my magnifiers for this without a doubt but let's first locate the position on the board they go here and here see that there and there right there's a square hole right okay so on the PCB there's one leg one hole of the six holes is square so check the bottom side the plus sign should match the square pad on the PCB so on the bottom here I don't think that's going to focus on this very well this leg here has a tiny little positive that side has a negative that has a positive sign on it so it's that that needs to go into the square hole so there's another tip on how to place them correctly is to guide 
is the guide on the top should match the small hole on the PCB and the long middle lead should match the cycle pad. Gee whiz. <laughs> the guide on the top, oh, there is a slightly longer leg. The middle, long middle lead should match the cycle pad. I don't know what that means. Great. Well, what all we could do is use the plus. So it's, that's the plus. So that needs to go into the square one. So it needs to go in like that. Now it says it's really important to get this right. So heck. Okay, that's in. Second one. That's the plus. And that goes into the square. Okay, slightly weird, but we're giving that a go. It says, once you are sure regarding their orientation, push them firmly down into their position. Right. If the button is not pushed correctly, it will touch the aluminium panel. And this will not allow it to rest to its oft position, or it will not be able to be aligned correctly with the whole of the panel. Okay, what are you saying, Knight? So you just got to make sure that that's flat and pushed down well. Again, this is a, a sort of a situation where uh, in some other projects I would put the I put this on in order to make sure that that's going to be right. Do you see what I mean? Maybe that's worth doing at this point. Now funnily enough it doesn't say solder them at this point but they appear to be so on the picture so Let's do that. So I'm using the front panel just to make sure that they stay in the right position. Now when I put this down, this is going to push up. But I'm still thinking that that is going to be helpful. Okay, I'm just going to do one leg on each. Just to make sure that's working. They're still a bit wobbly, but they have a certain amount of give themselves. Just going to try not to scratch my front panel. Put that on there again. Yeah, no, that's fine. So I will solder the rest of the legs, trying not to press too hard so I'm not moving it about. Yeah, that seems fine. Good. Good, good, good. All right, next we're on to next one to the sliders. Right. Place them on the PCB. Whereabouts do we place them? Oh, they will go down this end. The proper way to solder the sliders straight is to solder the top pin from the top side of the PCB, then turn the PC upside down and reflow the rest pins. Make sure they are placed correctly. It says make sure you have not set your soldering iron above 350 degrees. See mine's at 390. I always have it at 390. Never, oh crikey, never, never had a problem. I, I guess there's an issue here with potentially overheating these. And do not heat each slider pin for more than five seconds each time. Well, I guess it depends on your soldering iron, man. Mm. So, oh, okay, so it says the proper way to solder the sliders straight is to solder the top pin from the top side of the PCB. Right, now I'm getting you. So they seem to have turned it up this way round. Then they place these. Do you see that there's it's got two pins and it's got one pin? So the difficulty you're gonna have, perhaps, is that when this goes down, it might push these up when it hits the 
hits the floor. But there seems to be enough here to lift it up so that's not going to happen. So that's quite handy. Let's put all these in and just see for the moment. As I put it down, it's not pushing up on any of the any of the sliders. So I know that there's just enough clearance underneath for me not to have to worry about it. So it's saying I shouldn't have it more than 350 degrees. So let me see if I can remember how I change the temperature on this thing. So soldering from the top is not something that I do very often. But I'm going to give this a go. It's just difficult to know how you heat it. So I'm on 350. I'm going to need my glasses for this in order to uh, see what the heck is going on. So, see that on there yet? So there's the leg. I'm going to get get my soldering iron in there, pushing against the leg and the PCB. I'm going to see if I can get some solder in there that actually goes on it, and I'm also going to try to keep it central. I don't want to push it up. Not more than five seconds, it said. Heck, how are you going to heat it up? <laughs> it's a bit stressful. It's a bit stressful. All right, well, that's that's in and that seems flat. So I'm going to continue with this line of inquiry. I'm going to heat it up. I'm going to present some solder. And go with it. So... Oops, so try and center it as much as I can. Push against it and release. Be careful in here, there's a couple of surface mount components that you don't want to melt. And also be careful of the this the the neck, the shaft of the of the soldering iron that you don't lean it against anything plastic because that will melt. So be very careful when you're navigating in amongst all these patch sockets. So just be aware of that. Okay, I've got that in. That's heating up. Present some solder. It's going mostly onto the soldering iron. See, that does put them in quite well. Oh, I seem to have an extra one. <laughs> it's one year, look. Dipstick. Okay, one more to do before I get too excited. Okay, and again, I'm just going to check it with the front panel. Make sure I'm not way off. Oh, look. Beautiful. It does have you know a little bit of space in order to move around itself, but all of those are fitted in there really nicely. So, next up, it says we turn it upside down. Now this uh, size of these is going to be a little bit tricky, so I'm just going to move a couple of, of these around to give it a bit more support when I turn it over. You see what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Now when you're doing this, you can check that other pin to make sure that it's soldered all the way through. So... I've got two here, and that's the one that looks good. That looks good, looks good, looks good. That one looks rubbish, so I'm going to add a little bit more solder to that. There we go. Looks good, looks good. And this one over here, yeah, that all looks good. So definitely worth checking all of those to make sure it's got a nice, a nice volcano of of solder and then you can go through and solder the two pins at the other end <laughs> Looking good, looking good so far. Now time check, I've been doing this for about an hour I think so I hope that's a helpful indication of something and I'm up to the pots. Now, 
finally, oh, this is a finally. That sounds like we're moving on. I'm only on page nine of 28 in the manual, although that does include how you actually use the thing type manual. Place, so, you know, we're getting there. Finally, place the rotary potentiometers. So these, they will appear to be the same. Make sure they are perfectly straight, otherwise they will not be aligned correctly to their corresponding hole on the panel. So again, I'm going to recommend putting the panel on in order to make this work. Make sure you've not set the soldering iron above 350 degrees. Also do not heat each pot pin for more than five seconds each time. Interesting. I've never, never heard that before. Never heard that before. And I've never blown up a pot as far as I'm aware. But okay. We're, we're, we're just doing what we're told, all right? So these go... Put this around this way. So I've got four here, two here, one here, and a row along here. Those are the... Uh, those are the bits. Again, they should hold themselves in nicely. It's just that if any of the pins are slightly off, it becomes annoying to get in. But usually, <laughs> he says, if I can get those three in first, they snap in quite nicely. So I would try to position the three first, those three at the front, put those in, and then lean back into the rest of it. There. That's the lot in. So once again, before I solder them, I'm going to put this on. I'm going to put this this way up. The front panel, of course, will fall away, but they're all still poking into those holes. So it's still a valid, <laughs> still a valid thing to do, I think. Right, for these, you've got um, you know, the two big stands and they will take a little bit of heat and take a little bit of pu pushing in. Don't need to worry about those as far as the heat or time it takes to do it on, I would say. It's the three pins that you don't want to spend too long uh, holding the heat on, um, as they suggest, no more than five seconds. That's what I would say. It also says don't try to adjust the pot while it's hot. Okay, no, no problem. So I'm going to, oh uh, no, well, let me do one. Let me do one while you're watching and then we'll time lapse the rest, yeah? So well, we pick this one in the middle here somewhere. So I'm going to heat this. This leg, present solder to it so it entirely fills. Same on this side. You may find it easier to turn the PCB round. That's something you can certainly do. You know, make it as comfortable for you as humanly possible. That's good. And then these three, I'm heating it for one, two, three, four. There's solder. <laughs> heating it one, two, three. There you go. Heating this one, two, three. Done. Good. I'll see you on the other side. Great, what's next? Connection of the top and bottom boards. In this step, we will connect the two boards and solder their connecting pin headers. Okay. So, we want both of these. And these are going to be sort of, I think, sitting on top of each other like so. That seems to match up. See what I mean? These with these, that with that. Yep, so that's how they've got them. Let's do that. Locate the three 20 pin socket headers, these ones here. 
place them as shown in the pictures to make sure they are firmly attached to their position. Place them as shown. So what it's saying is that these need to go on top of the existing headers. So you see you've got the spiky headers here, the male headers, if you like. And the other ones, the sockets go on the top and you push them down. Careful not to spike your fingers. This is going to enable you to put the other board on and solder them and be absolutely sure that they are in the right place. So those are all on there. See that? Yeah. Next, locate two of the hex, annoying hex ones. <laughs> could I use some nerlies instead, do you think? Yeah, I probably could. Two spacers, metal spacers, that's two hex nuts, two spacers, two washers. Okay. These will be the base for the power board, right? If you're not going to use it with the USB power board, you should skip this step. Uh, it's a shame you have to make this decision at this point, because I think I will, uh, to start with, use it as USB, but ultimately I want it to go into my rack. So uh, I assume that it's not going to be difficult to take that power board off. Um, that's just the assumption I'm going to make. So I'm going to build this as if I'm going for a USB one. Okay, got it? Yeah. So first, uh, no, place them as shown in the pictures. Hex bolt on the top side of the PCB, then place the washer on the other side, then add the metal spacer. Right, so we're on this board. We want this end here. I want this to go in from the top. Yeah, and there's two there's two great great big holes there, so that's not difficult to understand. So that goes in there. Ugh, keep a finger on it. Put a little washer over the top, and then the metal hex thingy. Alright, they should be tight. Now let me go and see if I can got that Allen key thing. Like I say, un unwieldy. <laughs> Is that the right size? Yeah. So I'm going to attempt to put that on in there and just twist it against itself. That's on. Now prepare the top board spacer structure so as to be able to connect the panel and the bottom board. Find and place the 12 pieces times 11 millimeter plastic spaces. Right, and they go, they appear, let's go back to this, this one here. They appear to go through the corner and then screw onto itself. What, one in every corner and then a couple in the middle? Gotcha, right, gotcha. Okay, nice, that's sitting up. Connect the top and bottom boards as shown in the picture. Right, so we've got this, needs to be this way round. And we're gonna want these bits that we put in before they're all spiky to go through the holes here which might require just a little bit of adjustment and we've got one here too there we go there we go that's all in locate the 15 mil plastic spacers these one and turn the assembly upside down and lock the two boards by attaching the spacers in the picture shown Okay, right. So turn all this over because at the moment I've just got these little screw threads coming through and I need those, or these, to be screwed in here, which is what keeps the whole lot together. So I guess thinking about this power socket here, if you were just putting it straight into Eurorack, then you don't need these bits is what it's saying and you can just plug your power thing 
directly into there. I think that's what it's saying. In which case, to take the board off, looks like you just have to unscrew it. Okay, nice. It's sitting up now. Looking good. Looking good. Finally. Oh, that's our second finally. <laughs> we have to solder all of this along here. All right. That's no problem. These are very easy. You don't even need to do opposite corners because the whole thing is rigid and it's not going anywhere. So it's just a simple soldering job. Again, be careful of the plastic shrouds on this. So when I'm soldering that, I'm not going to bring the soldering iron in this way. I'm going to spin the thing around and do it from the other side. Yeah, makes sense. So good. I'm going to solder all this and I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> really good I mean look I've built a flipping synthesizer <laughs> that's pretty great now optional it says it says remove R40 if you want a long delay time where's R40 so down here down at this little edge here it says remove for long but low five repeats now there's a tiny little widdly surface mount resistor there called the R40. And so you could, if you wanted, take that off there. So let's just remove it for a longer delay. But it talks about how the length of delay, um, it deteriorates over time. So the longer the delay, the more crunchy the sound is going to be. I don't think I'm going to do that. I also worry about trying to remove a surface mount component when there's other stuff around it. So I'm going to leave that one for you. Tell me in the comments if you did it and how well that worked. That would be interesting. So let's ignore that for now. Right, finalize the module, it says. Mm, so place the aluminium panel over the top. Like so. Use six more hex bolts. Flipping hex bolts. To attach it in place. So there. All right, let's see if I can give him a little turn. Oh, I hate this thing. <laughs> ah. So it's looking like a flipping synthesizer now, isn't it? Isn't it just? Ooh. I am really liking liking the colour and the design on the front panel it's really nice <laughs> right what are we doing so next attach the power board power board power board from before as shown if you're going to use it in modular skip this part so oops turning it over well like like that so I guess this bit here goes in the socket and if you're using it for Euro rack, you would just plug the cable directly into that socket rather than this, which is converting this into USB here. A couple of screws. Okay, it's got it. It's gone in. It's gone in. Great, so there is my USB socket out the side. Now they suggest that you can cut off these bits here to make it sit that little bit lower. I'm not going to worry about that just now, am I? Am I going to worry about that? So I kind of like this lifted off the ground a little bit. I'm just going to leave that for the minute. The module is completed and you should now move to the tuning procedure. Okay. What I would like to do at this point is power it up, see that it actually is going to function. Let's do that and then worry about the tuning and stuff in a minute. I'm going to need a USB cable. It doesn't come with one. I don't know about you, but I seem to have a lot of USB cables knocking around, so that's not too much of a problem. So I'm going to put that in there. Plug it into my uh, USB hub over here. 
Look at that. We've got lights. We have lights. Oh, I've broken it. Now, what does it say? Okay, power the unit. You should see a light sequence between set and type. After the sequence, the type LED should blink at the LFO rate. Yeah, okay, it was so fast you couldn't see it blink. There, look at that, look at that. Look at that. That's pretty good. That's nice. That looks like a success. How awesome would that be? So if your unit doesn't power the first time, unscrew the small power board, plug the power board in alone, and then connect it to the module. Really? Plug the power board alone in the PC in the USB supply, and then while it's powered, connect it to the module. And if it still doesn't work, check your USB cable, or your adapter might not be providing enough milliamps, or you've done something wrong during the assembly. Nice. So I've got a MIDI keyboard, could be a CV keyboard for that matter, but I'm just trying to follow the instructions. This is the, the MIDI cable, which goes into the MIDI socket. I'm then going to need a MIDI cable. Now I've got an appropriately uh, purple one. That goes in there. And what I should be doing, of course, is seeing if there's any sound coming out, but I'm just going through it methodically at the moment. This goes into MIDI out on the keyboard, like so. Press the set button, or light, press any key, and then press set again. And now it's set to this, control, uh, to this MIDI channel. How exciting, great, right. Now do the following connections. CV out, which is placed in the MIDI to CV section, yeah, to oscillator CV in. Now it doesn't come with any patch cables either, so I'm going to have to uh, find a few of those. Because my, uh, you know, my assumption about this is that it's, it's completely modular. It's not semi-modular behind the scenes or anything like that. But again, I don't really know. So this is kind of experimental at this time because <laughs> it wasn't there wasn't like a video on it or anything. So this is what we're discovering. So CV, yeah. Place, uh, send that to oscillator CV input. So the ins are the ones that are coloured uh, with a background. The outs are the ones that are not. Got it. Right. Good. Uh, saw output, yeah to a monitor or somewhere where you can get a signal, very high signal level. Okay, right, so I need to plug that into something I can hear. Okay, so plug this into the saw output. Well, currently I'm not getting anything. Right, so a bit of a palaver. Sorted it out. It was to do with the USB cable. It was just either not up to the not up to the task or I wasn't plugged into the right powered output on my powered hub. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. But <laughs> what's going on with that? But uh, I've swapped the cable out. I've plugged it in differently. And now I seem to be getting... An output. Oh yes, an output. So that's good. Let's, let's go back to where I was. So I've got the MIDI plugged into the MIDI. What it wants you to do is take the CV out, plug it into the CV in there. So if you get no sound, try changing the cable. Just do it. Do it. And now when I plug this into the sawtooth output, I get 
to change the pitch. Okay, so we're able to do, we're now able to monitor the output. That's the saw, that's the noise, square, triangle. Great. So put the oscillator tune down to zero and fine at 50. Yeah, now observe or play some notes. Make sure that the pitch changes. Yes. Play with the tune slider and fine knob and observe the pitch changes. Yeah, okay. Then check the triangle and square outputs. Yeah, that all just seems to work. Okay. Finally check the noise, which will not respond. Indeed it doesn't. So remove the CV out to oscillator and then patch mod out to oscillator in. Connect the saw to your monitor. Adjust the oscillator tune at 50%. Moderate to 50%. Mod level and maximum. Observe the changes to the pitch. Move the mod rate to confirm that it works. Press the type button once. Observe the random LFO. Yes, that's what I'm doing. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead of myself, evidently. Press the type again. Move the rate up and down and set at 50. Press any key. Envelope modulation. Press type again. Move the modulation wheel. Okay, so this this is like a digital modulator section. I mean, I'll do a proper demo on this once we've got the hang of it, right? This is just initial fiddling about. But this allows you to pump in CV, which is what this is doing. It's a general LFO. It's a randomizer, or it's an envelope. That's its function. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Patch envelope out to oscillator CV in. Then the G out, which is part of the MIDI to CV converter, to the envelope trigger in. Set the fall at 50%, level at maximum. Observe the change in pitch. Now I'm assuming that. I need to have the sawtooth plugged in. LFO out to oscillator in. Now connect the sawtooth to the low pass filter input. Low pass filter output to the mixer input, of which there's three. Observe the change in pitch is not quite right I don't think because there shouldn't be any change in pitch at this point we play with the cut and re and resonance controls now connect the saw to the 12 db one input low pass to monitor band pass high pass now connect the low pass to echo in, out, now that needs to go still into there, output of the echo to the mixer, now we take the square wave to a monitor, LFO, to pulse width. That works. 
Then it says take the square wave to the VCA number one input and that out LFO to VCA um, CV. Take both channels. Then we're going to go to VCA uh, 2, do the same. There we go. Let's do the same for the third VCA. Then we're going to take the LFO into the malt and use the output of the malt to do exactly the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes, it's all working very well so far. The check is now complete. Okay, I think I've plugged everything into everything, which is the point at this point. So that's all that's all good. Right, eight pages to go. Tuning and calibrating the module. Right. Press set twice and set mod type to envelope generator. So how do I know? which mod type is envelope generator. So the modulator is LFO, sample and hold. Yeah, it looks like sample and hold. Envelope, see envelope is the one that's off. The one that's steady is CV. Okay, got that. So for the mod, it starts off with LFO, sample and hold. Envelope is the one that the light is off. Measure the mod measuring point to <laughs> what? and adjust the mod offset trimmer until it reads zero volts. This is very tricky and I'm going to try my best to go through it to show you what on earth it's about because I'm my head is like going what? So on this board on here is a test point test point number one which is mysteriously in this in this space here. And then you've got a couple of test points here which are labelled mod, CV, envelope generator, you've got noise at the top. And you've got these trim pots here which are labelled underneath. You have to sort of bend them back slightly. And then underneath you can see what they are actually referring to. Okay, so the first thing is we've got to find this number one point. Now the number one point I can see from the screen is so that's the noise that's that bit that's those two together it is this one there that is the number one test point that's where the ground has to go now the idea is that with this meter just put that to one side so you can see it hopefully i should be able to put the black one on one and this on mod and it should show me naught volts currently it's way off minus 10 so if I find the mod one the mod one is this one at this side so I need to turn that until it gets to naught volts now I don't have enough hands in order to achieve that all at the same time so I'm going to turn it a bit one way then I'm going to put that there that on mod okay that's worse so I'm going to turn it the other way put that on there back onto mod Okay, that's better. I'm trying to get it to behave itself. So I'm going to keep going in that direction. Like I say, you might have to do this with a little screwdriver. I've got this marvellous little tool which really helps this end here. It's got a little covering around the outside that fits perfectly onto that trim knob. Not far, oh look, not far off now. So just the tiniest tweak see it's a bit up and down but to me that's that's close enough that's gonna do I'm gonna go with that for the moment 
<laughs> sometimes with these calibration things you've just got to go as close as you can right so that's the mod offset trimmer now it's time to calibrate the cv out play the lowest note on the midi keyboard measure cv three point okay so that's cv here and adjust to zero volts see that's assuming that i have a keyboard that goes down to c0 does this go down to c0 i don't know <laughs> I mean, it depends on what MIDI keyboard you've got. I mean, I've got negative octaves, so I can play. That's the lowest C that I'm aware of. I mean, I guess I could look this up. I'm just going to have a go at this as it is, just for the moment. Maybe I'll try this again when I have a little bit more information. But I've gone to my, my lowest octave. And what am I supposed to do? Play the lowest note. And measure the CV point, And set it to... So where's the trimmer for CV? Is this third one? Is this one here? CV? Let's put it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I get it. Let's put it on there. And CV. But I've got a flipping heck. I've got to be able to put this on here. I must be doing, am I doing something wrong? This on here and this on there. Am I playing the, does it make any difference that I'm playing the bottom note? Right. So let's put it on the third one here. CV and there and I'm turning this until it gets to zero. Okay. There you go, near enough. Whew. Play again the highest note with the CV scale trimmer, just so it's nine volts. That was CV offset, CV scale is the one next to it. Okay. CV scale. So now I'm going all the way up the octave, playing the high C. And this is supposed to be nine volts. One volt per octave we're looking for. I see, okay. It's not far off nine volts. Nine volts. <laughs> right, so as I put this on here, continue to put this on here, that says nine volts, come down an octave, eight volts. Seven volts, near enough. Six volts, five volts, four, three, two, one, nearest, damn it, and zero. Look at that, flippin' look at that. I think I might have, I might have got that. That might have worked. Flippin' good. Dreadbox, what are you doing to me? Right. That seemed to work. I'm going with that. There's a noise level trimmer, which adjusts the level of the noise. This is not a specific way to adjust this level. It just depends on the user's taste. All right, I'm not going to worry about that for now. So proceed to oscillator tuning. To do so, the MIDI CV out needs to be patched to the CV in. Set the tune slider to 0%. Fine tune to 50%, nearest, damn it. Connect one of the wave outputs to a tuner. Oh, okay. Oh, and press A2 and adjust the tune. Well, I'm gonna to have to go and find a, a tuner. I guess an app on my phone might work. <laughs> and I've now got to find A2. I don't know which one that is. Which one's A2? In reference, 
darn it. <laughs> See, the, the problem with this, I think, is involving a MIDI keyboard in this rigmarole. Because I've, I've calibrated plenty of oscillators, and you generally just take that output, plug it into a, into a scope or a tuner, and you tune that. You're not worried about which key you're pressing on a keyboard. You're just tuning on an oscillator and then choose it, uh, tuning the octaves up and down from that. So this is what's causing me the problem because because it's a small MIDI keyboard, it doesn't have all of the exactly where it is supposed to be that it says it's supposed to be. It depends on, on where you are, if you understand me. So presumably this is C3, which makes that a A3. So A2 is going to be one down. Or is it? <laughs> so, I mean, you're probably watching this thinking, oh, he's just an idiot. I guess so. What I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to go away and sleep on it, come back refreshed in a new day, and look at it again. Because at the moment, I'm just going to lose my mind, I think. We're back. It's another lovely day. I feel I feel refreshed coming at this now on a Sunday morning to see whether I can I can just relax my way through this final stage of tuning and calibration so that we can have a finished a finished product. Uh, and I should apologize really because I mean I thoroughly enjoy soldering things together. I love all of that. That's fantastic. However, whenever I get to the end of a project and it comes to the calibration side, it it inevitably blows my mind for one reason or another. I get manual blind, I can't see anything, I, I get everything wrong. And it, it's it's an element of frustration that I have to, to, to get through, sadly. I'm sure when you do this, the calibration will be fine and smooth. And hopefully, if you've seen this video, you'll see that it does all work out in the end. Well, at least I hope so. So here I am. Tuning. At the end of the last episode, I got really messed up as to where the MIDI keyboard is and what is A2. And I had to go off and look at that because I wasn't sure whether A2 is before the C or after the C. Is it the C that defines the octave number or should it be the A? Because the A is obviously the start of the line of notes. But anyway, it turns out that uh, A2 is after C2, right? Now, what I learned about the Arturia Keystep 37 is that it covers all nine octaves. And when I go all the way down on the on the left octave button here, on the down octave, this is C0. This note here is C0. So that is what I discovered, I think, from uh, when we were doing the other thing. We were testing all nine octaves and they all seem to work, yeah? By the nine octaves, I mean the volts. It worked in terms of volts. Now we have to do it in terms of tuning. So... If this is C0, what I'm attempting to do is I need to get A2 and I need to tune it. So what I have here, I've got the dysphonia going through my O tool, which is a little uh, scope, which also has a tuner in it, which is going to help us achieve this. That's the plan at this point. You could use a, a, you know, a, an app on your phone to tune it with, but I'm just trying to do this as, I don't know, as hands-free as possible. I don't know. I'm just, just giving it a go, okay? So let's keep... Levels of, posi of positivity high as we go in. So as I was saying, this is C0, which means this is C1, this is C2, so A2 is here. That should be A2. Now what we're hearing, according to my tuner, is F sharp 4. So we're pretty well off, pretty well off at this time. I mean, obviously when I first put this thing together and I wasn't getting any sound, I did mess about with the trimmers in case that was the function. And so I might well have put them all out of all over the place where they shouldn't have been. Still, here we are to fix that. So, according to the manual here, this says, uh, MIDI CV out, patch the input of the oscillator. That's what we've got. That enables us to... to do that, yeah. Go back to my uh, A2, which is supposed to be that one. So set the tune slider at zero, <clears throat> fine tune at 50. You know, that's going to be a little bit arbitrary, isn't it? Let's put that there. <laughs> Connect the wave outputs, one of the wave outputs, to a tuner. Press A2, done that. Adjust the tune trimmer until it shows 110 hertz. Currently I've got 367 hertz. So we need to find 
the trim pot for tuning. So on this side we've got mod offset, CV scale, CV offset and noise level. So in which case it is on the other side. Ah! We have scale on one and tune on the other. So I can get that to settle. So tuning should be this one here on the left when it's upside down. Oh, it's a hair's breadth. Why is that still going up? <laughs> oh, darn it. So you're going to have to get it as close as you possibly can. The problem with this meter a little bit is that it's just that tad too sensitive. Close enough. Oh, look, there it is, 110. Great. So then what it says is you then play A5 and in just the scale trimmer so that it shows 880. So scale trimmer is the one next to it. So I've tuned to that, that's A2. So if I go up one, that's A3. Up another, that's A4. Up another, that should be A5. Really? I suppose so, it must be. That's currently says A5, 868. That's not far off. It needs to be 880. So I'm gonna take my tool, plug it into the scale trimmer I need to go up a little bit. Define 880, that's a little bit too far. Repeat this process until both, A, both A's are perfectly in tune and then check all of them. As expected with maximum deviation to be around five to 10 cents. So I need to go back down so this is five, four, three, two. A two should be. See, that's gone up a little bit. So what what you're doing with this tuning and scaling is you you've kind of got you've kind of got the the breadth of something and its position. So you're sort of moving its position around and then changing its how wide it is. Then you're having to shift it a little bit and changing its width again in order to get it to hit exactly on that start point and that end point. That's the idea. It's a bit of a rigmarole, it's a bit of a shuffle, but you'll get more or less there. I mean, in this world, synthesis, you know, absolute scent accuracy, I don't think is, is really what we're necessarily after. So you need to bring this back down to 110. So A2, three, four, five. That should be 880, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know, is this ever going to come? <laughs> I think that's good enough for me. I've got 110.1 and 880 point something. I think that'll do. That'll do. <laughs> Small amount of drift. Yeah, okay. Especially on the high frequencies is expected. Fair enough. And then you just check that it's about right. So if we go down there, C1. That's C1 as well. It's not gonna go down any lower than C1, so it seems. So that seems to be our, turn that up. So it doesn't go all the way down to C0, C1. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, so it's not far off. Nine, yeah, perhaps a little bit more than it needs to be. But I'm never going that high, am I? So there you have it, that's the calibration. It's easy, really, it just takes a little bit of thought. They do rather throw kind of a spanner in the works by having to use a MIDI keyboard to do it. You know, that is making the assumption that you have a MIDI keyboard and you know what it's all about. I suppose, but I guess we would have. So it's not a huge assumption. It was just kind of like, what on earth am I doing? I've now got to do, what have I got to do? So 
uh, the, you know, calibration and testing like that is always relatively complex compared to the actual build itself because there's funny stuff and fussy things and you've got to deal with scopes that are moving and drifting and you know the the manual tends to talk about preciseness precision and accuracy and that doesn't tend to be exactly what you see in the real world so my my humble opinion or advice is that don't worry too much get it as close as you can but things will move things will drift Trying to pick out the points on the back to do those sorts of testings with, it's a pain. It's difficult. If there was an easier way of doing it, I would I would tell you. I mean, potentially you could use uh, an earth by using a patch cable. This is something that you often do. Is because you know the sleeve on here is essentially zero, is earth. And that's what you're trying to put your scope on. Trying to put your uh, one of these bits on. Put your probe on when you're doing the testing. Um, you could do a similar thing by plugging this into any patch socket and if you've got crocodile clips on your scope you then attach it to that and that should be zero. However, because it's specified exactly where I'm supposed to put the bits and pieces I felt that I should follow that through despite the fact that that was an absolute pain in the ass. So, you know, when you know what you're doing, I think things probably get easier. But for our stage, where we are at the moment, comrade, <laughs> it's just going to be fiddly and complicated and frustrating in places. However, the testing, the calibration, I believe at this point, is done, which means we can now just get on with enjoying playing with the flipping synthesizer. Let's do that. So before we do that, just my final thoughts on the build. I mean, for a, a beginner kit in terms of soldering, it was not difficult. Uh, you're not dealing with uh, resistors and components. You're only really dealing with the front panel stuff, the big chunky stuff. And that's difficult to get wrong. The instructions were great. You had photos of stuff all the way through, which is always good. And any bits that weren't clear, I think I probably made enough fuss about those for you to know and understand what those bits are all about. It took... A couple of hours to do all that soldering, I suppose. But then I was, you know, I was talking and thinking about it. I wasn't completely focused on it the entire time. But it all came together relatively easily. The fussing about the end, it's just always going to be a bit of a fuss. And that's probably the hardest bit. I mean, the thing to understand is that you don't actually need to do any calibration at all to play with it. It's just that it might not necessarily be in tune with itself fully. So, you know, even if you get to that point and you can't do it, you've still got a working sound generating machine. As far as what I've discovered about the, the modulation section, uh, the, the various bits and pieces that are in here, it's really quite neat. It's lovely and interesting. I'm enjoying the echo already. Uh, in fact, you've got two filters in there. This crazy modulation, which gives you some, some random stuff, uh, some envelope stuff, some LFO stuff or bringing in CV from MIDI is all very interesting. You've got a MIDI to CV converter in here. Brilliant, that's really useful. So you can play it as a synth as well as just patch it into something else. The whole business with turning it into a URAC module is just a matter of taking this panel off the back and then using a ribbon cable to plug it in like you normally would. Maybe taking, I don't know, snipping some of that off so it's not so deep. You can snip these ends off, of course. We also already talked about that. But you do have three waveforms. You've got pulse width modulation. You've got lots of mixing and a molt, which is very useful. Three VCAs. You've got a lot of potential for shaping modulations as well as waveforms. Uh, a mixer, two filters, echo. It's a nice little featured synth. So I'm going to do some patching and I'll see you in another video to get into a deeper explanation of it or maybe some more sound demos. Who knows? But I hope that was useful. In the meantime, go make some tunes.